that's a bingo. Is that the way you say it? That's a bingo. Did you say bingo? Bingo! How fun! How fun indeed it is. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Nate Chacon the third. Welcome to Short Story Bingo. If this is your first time, welcome. If it's not, then the retention ro- uh, the retention program is working. What I do on this podcast is I am a glorified narrator to stories you have heard and some that you haven't. It's like Audible, sort of. So there's that. I um, want to give a big shout out to uh, Extra Team Media, man. Uh, we're definitely in uh, good mode right now. Ep- episode 53, but episode three um, in my head about the like the video series and can't say enough how uh you know how well it's been going been getting a lot of good feedback so props to uh george life and um you know all the work that he's doing uh make sure to visit extra if you have a uh a single that you want to have dropped an album that you want to have d- done uh consultation he does consultation as well uh sick drone shots for a video do you want to get a video done um all your media needs extra media.com all right, episode 53. Here we are, ladies and gents. Uh, last week, of course, we read from James Baldwin and his essays. Um, and the, uh, I don't know, you know, the plight of the, the American writer living in, in a different country. Um, we'll be reading more from that as well, you know, moving forward. But we are in October, so there's a couple things that obviously are going on. Fucking Halloween, for sure. And baseball. So I'm a big Yankees fan, um, as you can't tell or whatever. Boom, you know, fucking I'll drink to that. Oh, I hope you heard that. You ASMR folks probably love the fucking fact that I just sipped my drink like that. That's cool as shit. Uh, Today, we're going to read the Yankee years, uh, chapter 10 in it. It's called The End of the Curse. Uh, Joe Torre and Tom Verducci uh, got this, put this book out. And it's one of my favorite books. Uh, that, uh, yeah, just one of my favorite books in general. So, um, obviously, in 2004, the ALCS was between the Yankees and the Boston Red Sox. And the Yankees gave up a fucking 3 0 lead. They should have swept in four or at least just won the damn series. And Boston came back and won four games in a row. So, um, you know, baseball season. Let's, uh, let's read a little bit about that. Um, what else did I want to uh, touch on? Make sure to register to vote. The link is going to be there until November 3rd or there on after. So make sure to register to vote. Um, I don't know. What, what's the fucking cutoff date for registering to vote? Cutoff date. Register or cutoff date. To, oh, excuse me. Look, fucking Google already got that for me. Boom. Cutoff register date. Uh, voter registration deadline. In Utah, it is... Damn, this is just good to know, you know? Um, Seven days before... Also, a week before seven days. Good job, man. Well, so you got time. Just make sure... Yeah, the the link is in the the description to be able to do that, but it's super simple um, to be able to do. And, um, yeah. So, yeah, episode 53, man. I don't have a big-ass intro. I'm just excited for the weekend. I'm excited to um, just fucking keep reading, man. You know? That's about where I'm at. That's all, man. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I actually haven't read this chapter, so and it's because I've been avoiding it. Um, it was such a big thing, man. And we'll talk a little bit more about it as it's going through. But, yeah, talk about the 2004 ALCS, Yankees, Red Sox. Man, gave up fucking four wins in a row. And the Boston Red Sox, honestly, it should not even have been that close because they had Kurt Schilling and Pedro Hernandez. Um, Yeah, anyway, episode 53, short story bingo. Black, motherfucker, you know? Short story bingo. Short story bingo. Short story bingo. Short story bingo. Sometimes they're funny and sometimes they're sad. Most of the time they're funny because I hate to be sad. Short story bingo. Short story bingo. Short story bingo. Short story bingo. But don't take my word for it. Spare fingers. Yes.
already fucked up said pedro hernandez is fucking pedro martinez so that's one for the books already good job to me um god damn it all right whatever chapter 10 end of the curse the yankee years joe tory and tom verducci all right um Oh, my God. Just even starting this. Okay. The Yankees-Red Sox rivalry may have been the best thing to happen to baseball, but both managers came to loathe it. Each time the Yankees and Red Sox would play one another, even in April, hell, even in spring training, there was an Armageddon quality to the proceedings. Baseball never was designed to be like this. Not until October, anyway. The sport took great pride in the sheer volume of the season, a marathon, as the players proudly like to call it. But every game between the Yankees and Red Sox brought an NFL-like urgency to every game, every inning, every pitch. It ran counter to everything Joe Torre and Terry Francona tried to impress upon their clubs, knowing the wisdom of keeping their team on an even emotional footing. After just about every time the Yankees and Red Sox were done with one of these series, either Torre would call Francona or Francona would call Torre. Are you sick of this yet? Torre would say. I'm glad it's over, Francona would say. And that's how they fucking talk, okay? At least in this story. You and me both, pal, Tori would reply. See you in about six weeks. Tori and Francona shared not only a unique vantage point to the rivalry, uh, to the rivalry, to the rivalry, to the rivalry, God, Dude, I've, I have not... Well, I had a lot of cheese, actually, before this. Uh, don't eat cheese or dairy products if you're going to fucking sing, rap, do any sort of recordings. This, don't do that. If it's this, because it creates a lot of mucus. Rivalry. But an honest friendship. Oh, wait. That, that just sounded... Okay, Terry and Francona not only... Sh- or Fuck! Terry and Francona. Tori and Francona shared not only a unique vantage point to the rivalry, but an honest friendship. Torrey had played with Francona's father, former big leaguer Tito Francona, and had recommended Francona for his first managing job with the Phillies to Philadelphia, with the Phillies to Philadelphia general manager Lee Thomas. I played with Terry's dad, so I felt a closeness to him for that reason, Torrey said. I can still think of him as a kid, and I remember recommending him to Lee Thomas. Terry knew baseball. He was cerebral, and he wasn't showy. He was just a basic, good baseball person. Torrey and Francona believed that the whole Yankees-Red Sox dynamic had grown so big and so emotional that the managers dreaded it. It would wear you out, Torrey said. We had a common bond because we both would feel the same way. We're both going through the same pressures. There's really, there really is no favorite. There's no one team that's clearly better than the other. It's like Michigan, Ohio State. It doesn't matter how good your teams are. You're supposed to win each side. Can I? I'm going to speak to fucking the rivalry part for just a moment. Honestly, like I'm a, I'm a Bears fan too, so I'm I don't fucking care for the Packers. So and then obviously as a Yankees fan, I don't care for the fucking Red Sox. But. I get geeked when the Yankees and Red Sox play like the Yankees, like the Yankees going to be in first place, last place, Boston going to be in first place, last place. But it's always dope when they come together, just like he was mentioning, like Michigan, Ohio State or like Notre Dame and USC. I mean, I still remember for like with Notre Dame and USC and his example, Brady Quinn and that epic game. I think it was 2003 or some shit um, when they were playing Reggie Bush and they could have fucked uh, Notre Dame could have fucked up their whole season or at least curtailed it from getting to the national championship when they were playing in South Bend and Matt Leiner and Reggie Bush and that whole team ended up beating them. That's shit that I like I as a sports fan can, I'm sort of uncomfortable. Uh, I'm uncomfortable admitting how much I know about that shit because I should be focusing on other shit, but I love sports. So rivalries are fun. Okay. Um, uh, uh, okay. It's the media coverage that can wear you out. It's one game on the schedule and I know it's Boston. I know it's a team in your division, but I think the rivalry got out of hand as far as magnifying every single thing that went on in the game. It's absolutely, it's absolutely exhausting. And you know, what's interesting. The game is tense, but the game is even tenser only because you know, you're going to have to explain the outcome in every small detail. The game itself, though, is great. 
It's everything else that wears you out. From the time John Henry bought the Red Sox in 2002, when Boston began to make the commitment to look the Yankees in the eye and be a worthy rival, to the start of the 2004 American League Championship Series, when the Red Sox could best measure that progress, the Yankees and Red Sox have played 64 times. So from 2002 to 2000, okay. The, that progress, oh, excuse me, could best measure that progress. The Yankees and Red Sox have played 64 times, including the Titanic 2003 ALCS. Each team had won exactly 32 of those 64 games. Fucking, I didn't even know that. But I know that Boston had been trying to get over the hump for so fucking long. Fun fact, I was, I, I started, most of my teams that I, um, root for today it's because of books that i read when i was like six years old seven years old like a little impressionable kid so i read this little book it was like for third graders or something and that's and and it was just a uh like an autobiography book about babe ruth super simple book but at the beginning of it i started out as a red sox fan and then like midway through I went to become a Yankees fan and didn't like the Red Sox. Again, very small, impressionable kid and didn't like the Red Sox because the Red Sox uh, sold the babe to the Yankees. That's why I'm a Yankees fan because of a fucking dumbass 33rd grade autobiography book that probably was like 55 pages long. And I started out as a Boston Red Sox fan. I didn't have it because we don't have any teams here in Salt Lake or in Utah. I mean, beyond the like the the buzz at the time or the bees now, but as far as a major, uh, you know, major league baseball team, we don't have one. So I was just trying to find my footing when it came to my baseball team. And that's how it was. I started out as a Red Sox fan. So that's why this rivalry brings so much more attention to me or not tension, but like I, I bask in it a lot more. Both teams have made significant in season alterations to their clubs to get to the ALCS. And again, the ALCS, for those that don't know, it's the series right before the World Series. So you win, you go to the big dance. For the Yankees, it meant dumping the object of the intense and expensive international bidding war they had engaged in with the Red Sox less than two years earlier. Right-handed pitcher Jose Contreras, the big man who was supposed to be an ace for the Yankees, struggled with his command and the subtleties of pitching, such as pitching out of the stretch and holding runners. He also had a particularly harmful and unforgivable flaw with the Yankees. He could not pitch against the Red Sox. Blah! Pitch against the fucking Red Sox, dude. That's like... Oh, my God. Contreras... Oh, fuck. Contreras was 0-4 with a 16.44 ERA against Boston. ERA stands for earned run average. 16.44. So anytime he played the Boston Red Sox, double-digit fucking score... You have... Your offense had a, like definitely show up and show out if uh, this dude was on the mound don't put him in the fucking lineup then or sign someone new when the postseason starts <laughs> whatever he showed sparks a great pitching here and there tory, tory said and you know what that's the voice that i'm going to continue with and i make you laugh i'm here to fucking amuse you yeah what you know you funny what funny the how? fuck how is so funny? fucking funny um okay uh, his stuff was good, but he had a lot of issues that I felt. Oh, no, no, okay. He showed sparks of great pitching here and there, Tory said, but he had a phobia against Boston, and Boston just whipped his ass. He was tr- uh, tipping his pitches against them. They were in his head. They waxed him. They just waxed him. His stuff was good, but he had a lot of issues that I felt had to do with pitching in New York. I had gotten to the point where I said, he just can't help it. He just didn't seem comfortable in New York. On July 31st, 2004, the day of the trading deadline, the Yankees were on their way toward beating the Orioles, 6-4, to four, at Yankee Stadium, where, when Brian Cashman called Torrey. We can get Esteban Luiza for Contreras, Cashman said. Torrey quickly checked with pitching coach Mel Stottlemyre before getting back on the phone with his general manager. Do it, Torrey replied. Yeah, fucking whew. thank you, Joe Torrey, for doing that. <laughs> Fucking, yeah, dude, get him out of here. Loiza was something of an enigma himself. And as a player with free agent rights after the season, only a rental return on the investment in Contreras. Fuck it. Who gives a shit? Loiza was 9-5 and five for the White Sox, much better than fucking Contreras, but with a pudgy 4.86 ERA. I mean, whatever. The Yankees were his fifth team in seven years. 
I don't look at journeyman though in baseball like as bad as or just whatever. I mean, he's a major league baseball pitcher. It's the game has changed so much. Fuck the Padres and Cardinals just played the other night, and it was their closeout game. And the Padres used seven pitchers to finish the game. Seven pitchers or nine pitchers, something like that. It was, I think it was seven. But the point is, is like it wasn't just one pitcher throughout the whole thing. Bob Gibson just died at 84 years old. Old St. Louis Cardinals great. That dude was a beast. He would like uh, pitchers just are different now. They don't, I mean, unless you're like Clayton Kershaw, but like they don't uh, go the whole, they don't go the whole game like they used to. There's strategy now. You go five innings, six innings, and then you pass it off to your relievers. But seven fucking pitchers, they still pitch a shutout and beat the Cardinals. So if you're a Cardinals fan, that sucks. Um, The Yankees were his fifth team in seven years. He was 32 years old. Louisa had won 21 games the previous season, but it was the only year in his life he won more than 11 games. Okay. In short, Louisa was nothing more than a spot starter. The Red Sox once had brought up, uh, bought up all the rooms in a hotel to try to keep Contreras away from the Yankees. <laughs> but now here was the celebrated El Titan de Bronze in gloriously being dumped for a rotation filler. And the Yankees didn't think twice about it. Neither did Contreras. Though he held no, uh, no uh, excuse me. Though he held a no trade clause, he waived it without asking anything in return. At what time we were just looking for someone who could go out there? At that time, we were just looking for someone who could go out there and pitch. Tori said, "We could score runs. Our plan with our pitching was let's just try to stay in the game. But even that didn't work sometimes. I didn't realize it when I first got to New York." But after having been there a little bit, I understood that playing in New York was unlike playing in any other place. People either really embraced it or they just really had a problem with it. I think Kenny Rogers had a problem with it. David Justice did well with it. Roger Clemens, after a bit, did all right with it. Randy Johnson, no way. I have put Contreras in the group that had trouble with it. Man, it would be, uh, you know, it's New York. It's fucking, uh, you know, largest... Um, like the media capital of the fucking world. That'd be tough. That's why nobody wants to play for the Knicks right now too, you know? But playing for the Yankees is a whole different thing than playing for the Knicks. The Knicks haven't, I mean, gone to the championship since 1999. And then, uh, but the Yankees, you know, they're, they own, you know, they have New York's heart. But I get it for sure. I don't know. I mean, you got cameras in your face like all the time, unless you play for like the Milwaukee Brewers. Um, uh, or, or excuse me, if you played for the Milwaukee Brewers, it'd be a whole different process. I am. There's so many fucking tangents that I have going on in my head right now. Like CC Sabathia when he played, um, and then he went from where was he playing? Was he playing with Milwaukee? Fuck. Hold on. I I got to suffice this trade. There we go. CC Sabathia trade. I think he was with Milwaukee. Got him, dog. Yeah, the Brewers. Yeah, he was with the Brewers. But he handled it, like, you know, he handled it gracefully. He went from Milwaukee and that media market to New York and handled that really well. But it could probably take some people over, you know. Um, The Red Sox made an even bigger, more stunning move on that same trading deadline day. Epstein organized an elaborate trade, a trade web of four teams, including seven players, in order to dump an erstwhile star of his own, Shortstop, shortstop Noma Garcia Parra. The Red Sox obtained shortstop Orlando Cabrera from the Expos. Rest in peace to the Expos. Now they are not the Expos. What the fuck? They went to the Nationals, the Washington Nationals. That's what happened to them. The Rock, the, yeah, the Red Sox obtained shortstop Orlando Cabrera from the Expos and first baseman Doug Minkiewicz, um from the Twins as part of the exchanges. That trade and Doug McCabe stayed with the Red Sox for a while. Then uh, that trade brought brought more dividends for Boston than the Contreras deal did for New York. We had a fatal flaw, Epstein said. Our defense was terrible. Under Epstein and Henry, the Red Sox not only embarrassed statistical analysis, but also developed proprietary formulas to measure performance. When they ran the numbers on Garcia Parra's defense that season, they were astonished at what came out. He was, by a long shot, the worst defensive shortstop in the history of their database. Damn. This is just shit on Nomad just now. 
Uh, the Red Sox did not rely solely on the numbers. The numbers were backed up by the observations of Red Sox scouts who occasionally checked in on their own team. Okay. Whether because of age or uh, whether because of age or injury, he just wasn't getting to the balls he normally did. Pause, Epstein said. The pitching was really taking a hit, especially a ground ball guy like Derek Lowe in ways that you can't can't always see. We knew that teams that win the World Series typically have pretty rangy shortstops. Really, it was our whole infield defense that needed to be addressed. The other element pushing Boston toward dealing Garcia Parra uh, was that he no longer seemed to be a perfect fit in the clubhouse that had become a band of crazy extroverts who had become famously described as idiots. Famously described as idiots? But who famously described them as idiots, you know? Hey, what happened? Yeah, what happened there? Um... Okay. Uh, okay, Garcia Parra was more the quiet, brooding sort, especially ever since spring training of 2003 when the Red Sox offered him what he considered to be a below-market contract extension. He was understandably upset, Epstein said. He became isolated. When Epstein put Garcia Parra on the trade market, only one team, the Cubs, showed any interest at first. They offered to send Boston... 24-year-old outfielder David Kelton, but they also wanted to swap pitcher Matt Clement for low. Epstein said no thanks and furiously went back to work. He eventually pulled enough strings to line up with Cabrera and Minkiewicz, two players renowned for their defense. Uh, two, minutes, uh, two minutes before the deadline, I thought it was dead, Epstein said. I must have made four dozen calls in the last half hour. It ended up happening right at the deadline. We thought it was the right deal. We knew Cabrera was good offensively, but was underperforming. But we knew uh, what we knew about his personality convinced us he would have no problem being put on the big stage with everyone watching. It was just what we needed, and we thought our first base defense had been equally shaky. We got two guys hitting about 230 at the time, but we thought it was what we needed. We had power. We had a really good pitching staff, but defense was killing us. These guys were exceptional defenders. It helped. Our starting pitching got on a huge roll starting in mid-August. They went 30 and 13. Dog, that's fucking good general manager work, man. Epstein obviously famously went to the Chicago Cubs um, after his years, after they broke the curse, the curse um, in Boston, and won a championship with the Cubs in 2016. Theo Epstein is uh, really awesome. I mean, just knows his shit with baseball, so. Uh, okay, if the Red Sox had outmaneuvered the Yankees the previous November, they had done so again in August. After the deadline deals, the Red Sox were the best team in baseball over the remainder of the season, 42-18, and 18, five and a half games better than the Yankees, which, who, um, which were 36-23. and 23. Over, that, um, over that year, for sure, I thought they were a better ball club than us, Torrey said, but the games in the postseason have nothing to do with the season. At that point in time, you throw everything out the window. We certainly were conditioned enough to know that there was nobody on the field that could beat us. I mean, they got our attention. I'm sure we got their attention. Boston's sweep of the Angels in the division series allowed the Red Sox to align their rotation to have Schilling and Martinez open the first two games of the ALCS at Yankee Stadium. Damn. See, and that's what I was saying like at the beginning. That That's a killer-ass combo. Fucking Kurt Schilling, who is on his shit. That's like the... You know, that's the I think that's the year uh the bloody sock game and you know, and Pedro Martinez, not Hernandez, was pitching out of his fucking mind. So to have them both ready for the first two games of the championship series, man, they did really good. I mean to set themselves up by just sweeping the angels, like just brushing them the fuck aside and being like, Okay, let's just finish this out. It sounded great for Boston. Schilling, however, was a diminished pitcher. He had hurt himself while pitching in the division series, tearing a tendon sheath in his right ankle. A wholly ineffective shilling was gone. After three innings in game one, um, having buried his team in a 6-0 hole. Damn. Hold on, let me run that back. He had hurt himself while pitching. This is what I was talking about, the fucking bloody sock thing. He had hurt himself while pitching in the division series, tearing a tendon sheath in his right ankle. A wholly ineffective shilling was gone after three innings in game one having buried his team in a 6-0 hole. One out into the seventh inning, the Yankees led 8-0, and Mike Mussina was throwing a perfect game. The Red Sox suddenly showed their might, 
and before the Yankees could get five more outs, it was eight to seven. And Boston had the tying run. Now, mind you, again, this is at Yankee Stadium, so this is a home game. Starting the ALCS, um, you've you've been spotted uh, six runs. And, um, you know, you allow seven runs. I mean, fucking playoff baseball is so much different, though. Like, that shit can happen. Uh, could get five more outs. It was eight to seven. And Boston had the tying run at third base and Kevin Millar batting. Torrey brought in Mariana Rivera. <laughs> Killer Closa. And that was the end of Boston scoring. Hell yeah, it was. He retired Millar on a pop-up, and the Yankees wound up winning 10 to seven. Boom, up 1-0. Okay, notch it up. The Yankees also won game two. Boom, up 2-0. You know what I'm saying? Though they did so in far different form. With Lieber besting, Mart- um, with Lieber besting Martinez in a classic pitcher's duel. 3-1. Once again, Torrey gave the ball to Rivera with a runner on third and one out in the eighth inning, and the great closer locked down another victory. Mariano Rivera was uh, known for that, you know. There would be no need for Rivera in Game 3. Oh, yeah, Game 3 was crazy. They won 19, 19 to 8. So, boom, up 3 to 0. Oh. Three games to zero. That's, I mean, um, is it John Lieber? Is that what his name is? I believe it's John Lieber. I, I know it's, uh, it's, hold on. I got to look at it. John Lieber. Yeah. John Lieber, I uh, saw an interview that he had, and he had mentioned like after Game Three, after they won nineteen to eight, that Boston Red Sox players were like saying to Yankees players like, "Hey, good luck in the World Series." Even though they still had they still had to win one more, and um, a lot of guys in in the Yankees clubhouse are like, "Okay," they they were taking it in stride as far as like being like, "Yeah, we got this in the bag. This is a wrap." Um, let's kind of look forward to what, you know, the next series or to the world series, because we're up three games to zero, man. That's it. It's a wrap pretty much shit. If you lose game four, all good. You win game five as a gentleman sweep, or maybe you lose game five, two, you go down, you're still up three, two, just close it out in game six. Um, Oh shit. You lost game six. Okay. Well, if I could, we'll figure out in game seven. You can't lose four in a row. You can't lose four in a row. You got you. You can't lose four in a row. You know what? I'm gonna take a drink. I don't. You know why? Because you can't lose four in a row. That's why. You know how ridiculous that is to lose four in a row. What did Boston? What did uh, Cleveland? The Cavaliers? They won three. They were down three one to the. They were down three one to the Warriors, and then they came back in the finals. That three one. That's still not 3-0. You still have to win four games in a row. If you're down 3-0, 3-1, three games in a row. That's that's like two games is good. Three games is a streak. P- teams go on winning streaks all the time. But 3-0. Holy Jesus. What is that? Yeah. What the fuck is that? Yeah, man. Um, I remember 2004, I was... That was the, the 2004 was the um, Steve Bartman shit, uh, uh, the C- Cubs and Marlins. I was uh, in um, no 2000. Yeah, 2004 was the Steve Bartman shit. But like 2003, I just went into the Air Force, and like all this shit was going on. I was in basic training, so I yeah, I remember all this shit. Just like waking up each morning, being like, oh shit, what happened? The Cubs were supposed to beat the Marlins. Oh my god, and they didn't even beat anyway. No, not anyway. This is my fucking podcast. I'm fucking. Like, I'm gonna stay on that three to three games to zero. Win it, and go on to the World Series like you're supposed to. Just win it. Okay. There will be no need for Rivera in Game Three. The Yankees won 19 to eight with a prodigious showing of hitting in a game that had been tied after three. And Game Three was in Boston at Fenway Park. Shit on them at their own house, 19-8. to eight. Um, With a prodigious show of hitting in a game that had been tied after three innings, 6-6. Six to six. Okay, so it started off close. Okay, that's right. The Yankees were rolling up three games to none. A lead no team in the history of baseball had ever lost until then. Um, How the fuck am I funny? What yeah, the fuck is so funny, funny about, about me? Tell me. Um, Tell me what's funny. 
All was not perfect, though. Yankee starter Kevin Brown, who was supposed to be the ace of the staff and who had battled back problem, uh, who had battled back problems most of the year, had pitched horribly and did not look right. In only two innings, Brown gave up four runs on five hits and two walks before Torrey sent Vasquez to replace him to start the third inning. Vasquez, too, was hammered, yielding four runs on seven hits and two walks in four and a third innings. Ugh. It's like I'm it's like I'm listening, like I can see it happening. It was only the latest episode to explain why Brown um, engendered no confidence, uh, no confidence from his teammates. Kevin Brown at the time, too, uh, he was traded to the Yankees or did he sign his deal? I tr I'm trying to remember that, but he came from the Padres um, and he was killing it with the Padres. And I mean, like a big, big, lead, big, big arm. And um, yeah, it was sad to see him kind of go into the shitter, not going in the shitter. It's I, when I say shit about professional athletes, I have, I try to watch myself because they're professional athletes still. And you know, they go on any fucking diamond uh in your town and just pull up dumb stats i bet kevin i mean kevin brown's only a pitcher but i bet he can just like hit balls out of a fucking 250 um you know 250 uh foot <laughs> um little diamond that you that your fucking kid brother plays on um all right so but his teammates weren't liking him or he wasn't like j resonating with his teammates Brown had a famously rotten temper and a surly disposition, attribute, uh, attributes that did not serve him well at a time in his career when he could no longer throw as hard as he once did and didn't have the wherewithal to concede to age and battered body in order to make adjustments. Brown had missed seven weeks over the summer because of a strained lower back and also because of an internal parasite. On September 3rd, my birthday, pitching against, uh, pitching against Baltimore, Brown was staked to a 1-0 lead when he gave up a run in the second inning, yielded another in the third, uh, tweaked his knee while covering first base in the fifth, and was struck on the right forearm by a run-scoring hit in the sixth. That stretched the Orioles, uh, the Orioles, uh, the Orioles, Orioles, the Orioles lead to 3-1. to one. It was all too much for him, and his short fused the bear. After getting out of the inning, Brown stormed off the field and straight up the runway leading to the clubhouse. Stottlemyre, knowing Brown's low boiling point and, um, and concerned about the shot the pitcher took off his arm, decided he should walk back to the clubhouse to check on the right-hander. He found Brown standing in the narrow hallway outside of Tory's office, seething. Are you okay physically? Stottlemyre asked him. To look like, Brown snapped back. Brown wheeled away from Stottlemyre, walking into the main portion of the clubhouse. He stopped at a concrete pillar and hauled off on it. Throwing a hard punch, Brown quickly bent over in pain, holding his hand. God, dude, how many people fucking break their hand when they're so pissed off they punch a wall? They're like, oh, man, I broke my knuckle. I knew a kid um, back in the day. He would, uh, um, at parties, he would punch people. And this sounds ridiculous now that I'm saying it out loud, but he would punch like beer bottles um, and just like, like all the time. He did it all the time. Like just punch through beer bottles. I was, we were like 19 or 18, something like that. 17, something or like 20. I, it was, I was young. Um, and one day, one party, his whole life changed because he punched through this fucking bottle and uh, the thing, he fucking severed his tendon he just severed it and that his whole life changed because of that. Just like punching through a, a glass or, you know, a fucking Bud Light bottle or some shit. And yeah, I was, it was just so, uh, I don't know, you know, so finite of a thing to happen over something that doesn't matter. Like, I, I don't know. It was just super. So Kevin Brown punching a wall. I mean, we all got a friend that does that shit. I guess is what I'm saying. Tell me that wasn't your right hand. Solomar said, Brown didn't answer because it was his right hand. Sotomayor thought he saw that Brown was holding his left hand. Are you all right? The pitching coach asked. Still no answer. Brown kept ignoring his coach. Kevin, Sotomayor said, I need to know if you can go back and pitch or not. You got to tell me something. Brown looked down at his hand. Finally, he spoke. No, he said. I'm not all right. 
<sighs> Sotomayor knew the first order of business, which was to alert Tory because the Yankees would need to get a better or get a pitcher ready to replace Brown. He walked down the runway back to the dugout. God. Don't let your emotions get the fucking best of you. Jesus. And also, it's a fucking game, man. Nope, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. These guys are fucking high-level alphas or whatever. And so, I don't know. That just sucks. Fuck. Your pitching hand? Your fucking pitching hand? You couldn't have kicked it? All right. Joe, he said, you're not going to be too happy with your pitcher. What'd he do, Tori asked. He punched the wall, Stoudemire said. Might have broken his left fucking hand. He didn't say fucking, but I did. Now Tori left the dugout and headed up the runway and into the clubhouse. He found Brown and immediately began to scream at him like a fucking he should have. That's the most fucking selfish thing I've ever seen anybody do, Tori said. I have no patience for that shit. I'm sorry, Brown said. Tory's anger and tongue lashing quickly subsided. He saw that the man in front of him was a beaten man, said Tory. At that point, he was so demoralized. He was never a fighter. He never wanted to fight you. Neither was Randy Johnson, for that matter. I like Kevin Brown. The difference between Kevin Brown and David Wells is that both make your life miserable. But David Wells meant to. I don't think Kevin Brown meant to. I don't think Randy meant to. And that's what I go on. I'm glad he's fucking said something, though. God. Brown came back from the broken hand to make two starts before the end of the regular season, the first of which was a nightmare against Boston in which he couldn't get out of the first inning. The Red Sox pounded him for six hits and four runs in that abbreviated time. Brown simply generated no good feelings from his team, and ALCS Game 3, while ending up in a blowout victory, continued with Brown as the carrier of bad karma. Hardly the role the Yankees had in mind when they traded for him and had and his $15 million, or $15 million per year salary to take the sting out of losing Pettit, Andy Pettit and to provide a return volley to the Red Sox for getting Schilling. Uh, buried within the Game 3 win was another troubling sign. Buried within the Game 3 win was another troubling sign. Torrey brought in setup reliever Tom Gordon to pitch the ninth inning with the score 19-8. to Okay, should be fine. Um, it was the third straight game in which Gordon was used. Not so much, probably, then. Don't use him if it's the third game in a row. Why would Torrey... Oh, my God. See? Fucking... Why would Torrey... Uses key. Uh, why would Tory uses key eighth inning reliever in a blowout? Exactly, exactly. Gordon badly was in need of a confidence boost. Okay, sometimes you just got to see that. Sometimes you just got to get a win, get a strike, get a couple of them, get a couple strikeouts. I got that. Okay, all right. He appeared jittery in both game one and game two, giving up two runs and failing to pitch cleanly in both outings. Tory thought giving him the ninth inning, when with nobody on base and an eleven run lead. <laughs> would relax Gordon and give him confidence that would carry over into the next time Tory needed him in a tight spot. Nonetheless, Gordon still appeared on edge. With one out, he gave up a double to Trot Nixon. Then he uncorked a wild pitch. He did strike out Millar and retire Bill Miller on a fly ball to end the inning without a run scoring. Okay, it represented progress for Gordon, but only by a small step. Vasquez, Brown, and Gordon all had struggled, but how much could that really matter at this point? The Yankees led the series three games to none. The Red Sox were as good as dead. You hear that? Good as dead. Oh, my God. Okay, the Red Sox were as good as dead. In the history of Major League Baseball, the NBA and the NHL, teams trailing 3-0 in a best of uh, seven series, were two and 231. And if you don't, and let's just do some quick math. What's, uh, I'm going to, we're going to do this together like this. Bring up the calculator. Two, th- we're going to do what that percentage is. Well, and I don't know how to fucking use a calculator, so that's my first time. 0.0086%. chance of a team oh, that's the percentage that happened oh my god in a best of seven series were two and 231 it doesn't happen it doesn't happen the red sox had a 
85 or a point again what i just said a 0.85 percent chance not even a percent chance dog the Red Sox had a 0.85% chance of winning the series. The only teams to recover from the bottom of that well were the 1942 Toronto Maple Leafs and the 1975 New York Islanders. The Yankees were starting Orlando Hernandez. Oh, El Duque, boom. <laughs> Got him. The veteran right-hander with a 9-3 career postseason record. Dog, closeout season has returned, baby. The Red Sox were starting Derek Lowe, who had pitched himself out of the postseason rotation and was only getting the ball because the scheduled Game 4 starter, Tim Wakefield, pitched him relief in Game 3 to save Frem Kona from blowing out his bullpen in the route. Yo, Game 4 looks like it's in the bag. We're ready to go. A few hours before Game 4, Epstein watched Schilling muster his way through a bullpen session at Fenway Park using a special boot-like spike to try to give support to his wobbly right ankle. No one was sure if he could pitch again in the series. Actually, no one was sure there were going to be any more games in the series. On his way from the bullpen to the dugout, Epstein was stopped by reporters on the warning track down the right field line. They had obituaries and epitaphs to write about uh, this Red Sox team, and they wanted the team's general manager to cooperate. Epstein wasn't playing along. Guys, he pleaded. We have one game to win tonight. That's our focus. The line of questioning didn't end. A columnist with the sound of the Yankees' bats still ringing in his ears after the 19-8 shellacking asked, um, asked Epstein, is what happened yesterday an indictment of the lack of professionalism in your clubhouse, especially contrasted to the Yankees? Is that a sign that you can't win, you can't win with, this, with the kind of lawlessness in your clubhouse? Guys, Epstein said, barely concealing his anger. We not me. Uh, we might not win, but it has absolutely nothing to do with our mar makeup. The dude had to be pissed. He had to do because of answering those questions. Epstein marched off into the clubhouse. He was hot. It wasn't the reporters that bothered him most. It was how everything invested in this season, going back to the motivation to redeem the Aaron Boone game, to the stealth securing of Schilling, to the hiring of Francona to the bold trade of Garcia Parra, all of it could be washed down the drain without winning so much as one game against the Yankees. It was just a thought in the back of my head that wouldn't go away, Epstein said. I was so pissed off about the possibility of getting swept. I'm thinking, I cannot fucking believe a team this good that plays so well down the stretch and could so easily win the World Series is going to be swept by the Yankees. We cannot let it happen. When Epstein looked around the room, he saw reason to be encouraged. Okay, they were still really loose. He said of his players, they had an incredible, uh, they had incredible makeup. Pause for sure. Pause. What the fuck? I know what he means, but yo, uh, Millar, the first baseman who was always quick with a quote, a laugh, or a joke, was walking around the room saying the same thing over and over again. Don't let us win one. Don't let us win one. It became the idiot's rallying cry. <laughs> Yes, don't let him win one or four. Fuck. So sad. <laughs> oh, my God. And for him for to, like, just be in there, like, I mean, what else were they going to do, man? They were down 3-0. Who gives a shit at that point? Don't let us win one. I mean, that probably would have been me. Shh. I don't know. Fuck them. As Millar, as Millar recounted, I was thinking, you better beat us in game four. Because if we win it, look out. I didn't like our matchup in game four. I didn't know how we were going to do it, but don't let us win. Because now we got Pedro in game five. And now we got Schilling in game six. And in game seven, anything can happen. And he's totally fucking right. So I knew once we, would, we could win that game, the entire pressure went to them. We didn't have any pressure. We were supposed to lose. We're down. Now we're just having fun. Now we're just going now we're going to watch them choke. That's basically what it boils down to. We're going to have fun and keep battling and those were great games. Yo, um, you know, he uh Bing -pong. Yeah, he said it like he Yeah, that's the best summary for it, man. Just win and then you got Pedro, game five, Kurt Schilling, game six, game seven. It's a, you know, it becomes a one game thing and just fucking win. Oh, God. The Yankees scored first on a two run home run by Alex Rodriguez in the third inning. Cool. 
All right. It would be the last time Rodriguez drove into... <laughs> As I said that, it would be the last time Rodriguez drove into base runner. <laughs> Uh, it would be the last time Rodriguez drove in a base runner in the postseason in this series and the next three pro seasons combined. Fucking thank you. A span of 59 at bats overall in which he batted 136, including 0 for 27 with 38 total runners on base. <sighs> the Yankees lost the lead when Boston nicked Hernandez for three runs in the fifth. Then sees it right back with two runs in the sixth. The tie-breaking run scored on an infield hit by Tony Clark. Torrey put the 4-3 lead into the hands of Tanya and Sturtz, not Gordon. And Sturtz came through with two scoreless innings. Dope. Okay. Cool. Now the Yankees were six outs away from sweeping the Red Sox. Up 4-3. Okay. Boom. Uh, honestly, my fucking... I'm like... I don't know if you guys do this, but I, I watch like old um, old games and I still like even if I know the outcome, I'm, I'm like fucking uh, a, a game to reference is like the 1995 NBA finals between the uh, Rockets and the Magic um, and where Nick Anderson misses uh, free throws at the end of the game to like seal the win and not go into overtime. Every single time he goes, I'm like, oh, he might get them. He might get them. And this is what I'm doing right now as I'm reading this. We just got six outs left, and it's a wrap. 4-3, going to the World Series. Okay, now the Yankees were six outs away from sweeping the Red Sox with the heart of the Boston order due up in the eighth inning. Torrey was absolutely sure who was going to get those outs. Rivera. Gordon's shakiness didn't even come into play now. Torrey's closer was fully rested after three days off. Torrey always worried about giving a near-dead opponent any reason for optimism. Rivera, even for six outs, was the surest option in baseball and the king of postseason closers. It was time to step on the throat of the Red Sox. Dog, it's like right here. It's done. Rivera yielded a single to his first batter, Manny Ramirez, but it was classic Rivera for the rest of the eighth inning. Three consecutive outs on 13 pitches. Dope. 15 total for the inning. Dope. Without the ball leaving the infield. Dope. A strikeout of David Ortiz and ground balls from Jason Veritek and Trot Nixon. Dope. Okay. The Yankees went quickly into the into the top of the ninth against Keith Folk. Three outs to go. The Yankees held an extreme advantage over Boston. In all best of seven series games, the road team leading by one run with three outs to go was 77 and 11. An 87.5% um, uh, <laughs> What the fuck just fell? Is that nothing? Did you see anything that fell? Oh, nice. Cool. Fucking sweet. <laughs> uh, anyway, okay, so we're 77-11 and 87.5% success rate. Representatives from Major League Baseball properties carried large boxes into a back room of the Yankee clubhouse. Oh, this is classic. When it happens, watch. You're going to see what I'm talking about. The boxes held dozens of hats and T-shirts that said New York Yankees 2004 American League Champions. Little did we know that those were going to go to some other third world country and be on some other kid. Um, there was no champagne being prepared yet. The Yankees were so experienced at those kind of celebrations and so cautious not to jinx them that their clubhouse staff learned to wait for the last possible out. They could set up for the party in under 10 minutes. Cool. Right there. Top of the ninth inning. As Rivera prepared himself to leave the dugout to pitch the ninth, Tori thought of passing on to him a word of warning about the leadoff hitter, Millar. He thought about having Stottlemyre or even himself tell Rivera to be aggressive with Millar. He let the moment pass without saying anything. It is a decision that gnaws Tori to this day. If there's one thing I can, uh, if there's one thing I can second guess myself about, Tori said, it was in 2004 with Mo going out in the ninth inning. I didn't tell Mel. Tell him, don't get too fancy. Or I was going to go to him and tell him, don't get too fancy. Go after him. Don't worry about trying to make too good of a pitch. The only reason I didn't say anything is I remember the last time he faced him in game two. Rivera had faced Millar, representing the tying run with Ramirez at second base, with two outs in the ninth inning of game two. The at-bat was relatively brief and emphatic. Called strike, ball, strike swinging. 
foul, strike swing for a strikeout to end the game. Pitch perfect. Just done. That's the only reason why that's the only reason I didn't plant the seed, Tori said. Because of how easy that at bat was. I said, fuck it. Because oh woo, I like that shit. Because I didn't want to plant a seed that wasn't there. It was so easy the last time. I don't know what I would have done either, but I, I would have just been like I definitely it's a thing in baseball to not like talk to the pitchers if they're having like an incredible game, you know, like if they're having a complete game, um, or a no hitter, things like that, or a shut or pitching a shutout. But I don't know. I mean, he knows fucking more than me. He was the fucking gen- uh, the manager of the team, you know. Joe Torre's fucking dope. But I don't know. Just if he's saying that he regrets it, I wonder if he would have said something to him and been like, "Just finish it. Just finish him. Just pitch as hard as fucking possible. Fuck him." Um, that's aggressive as shit. See, I'm getting aggressive because I don't like the Red Sox that much, and we should have won that game. But like, I just felt it, and I know that you guys just heard it, but. Whatever. Anyway. Okay. That game two at bat, however, occurred at Yankee Stadium where Millar's pull everything hitting philosophy was penalized by the expansiveness of left field. The game four at bat occurred at Fenway Park where a fly ball to left field could easily uh, easily be off or over the towering wall that seemed to loom over a pitcher's shoulder. He's referring to the green monster. In that ballpark, you're trying not to make a mistake to him, Tori said. It's a little different than in our ballpark. On the other side of the field, Francona did not bother to say anything to Millar. No, Millar said. There's nothing to say. In that situation, we're down by one. We're down 0-3 in the series. You got Mariano Rivera in the game. There's not a lot of sunlight on us, but you know what? That's why you've got to play the game. And he's so fucking right. Millar was a 360. Damn. Okay. Millar was a 364 career hitter against Rivera in the regular season with four hits, including one home run and 11 at bats while also once getting hit by a pitch. That's incredible against Mariano Rivera. Just for context, most hitters would begin the ninth inning while down one run, trying to find any means possible to get on base to grind out and at bat in survival mode. But these were the idiots, and this was Millar, who was one of the premier practitioners of the kind of brazen idiocy that served the Red Sox so well. There was only one thing on Millar's mind. Try to jack a Rivera pitch over the green monster in left field. I've always had good at-bats against Mo, Millar said. Decent numbers, but you don't want to make a living facing him. He's a power guy, and and I like the fastball, so I was just thinking one thing. Get a pitch up. And middle in and hit it out for a home run. That was my thought process. Just try to hit a home run. There was no looking away. So I was basically in watch mode. If I could just get something up and leaking in and I was trying to pull, I thought that was our only chance. That's what I felt. The watch mode approach served Millar well because he was going to swing only if the ball entered the area in which he was watching. Millar actually made himself patient. The downside of his approach is that he essentially conceded the outer half of the plate to Rivera, at least until he got two strikes. Rivera never got to two strikes. He missed with his first pitch. Okay, Millar fouled off the next, one and one. Then Rivera missed with three consecutive pitches, putting the tying run on first base with a free pass. What were the odds that Rivera would walk the leadoff batter? Through 2004 in his regular season career, Rivera had faced 110 leadoff batters in the ninth inning while protecting a one-run lead. He had walked only four of them. Out of 110, he had walked only four leadoff batters in the ninth inning. I'm telling y'all, man. I mean, if you're not... Uh, I know some of my listeners don't aren't... Uh, well, I don't know this, but like, if you're not into baseball that much, just uh, it, Mariano Rivera is... Uh, in the Hall of Fame for a reason, incredible closer. This book might not be given uh, enough detail to. It was a, it was a slam dunk, a home run, whatever the fuck you want to say about it. He was in the game and it was a wrap. Even Kevin Muller said it just right there. He's like, yeah, not a lot, not a lot. Uh, excuse me, not a lot of sunlight for us. Mariano Rivera's pit closing the game. They're winning. It's a wrap. Pretty much, it's a wrap. Just try to fucking hit. But he had a good, you know, I don't know. It's a fucking wrap. Um, okay. Uh, Rivera had faced 110 leadoff batters in the ninth inning while protecting a one-run lead. He had walked only four of them, and only twice did those walks 
uh, presage a defeat. One of them occurred only one month earlier, coincidentally, against the Red Sox, a game that suddenly looked eerily predictive. On September 17th, Rivera began the ninth inning by walking Trot Nixon with a 2-1 lead. Dave Roberts pinch ran and stole second base as Veritex struck out. Rivera hit Millar. Damn it, this is that pitch. Rivera hit Millar with a pitch. Cabrera knocked in Roberts with the tying run. One out later, Johnny Damon knocked in the winning run with a single. Millar's walk in game four gave the Red Sox that shred of belief that Torrey wanted to avoid. So they're up 4 3, we're on first, and still Mariano Rivera at the plate. You're looking in, M- M- Millar said of his approach. And the thing is, sometimes when you're aggressive at the plate in an area like that, your hitter's instincts will be to lay off. Whereas sometimes when you think you have to cover too much of the plate and you start chasing more, I was just actually looking for one pitch. I was looking dead red and in. When you're facing Mariano, you just hope he's not hitting his spots and you might have a chance. He's definitely tougher against lefties. He's not blowing up bats against righties that he does the lefties. Francona sent in Roberts to run for Millar. Great move. Roberts was on his own meaning he was free to attempt to steal second base whenever he thought he could get the bag. Roberts, however, was chilled, stiff, and a bit jittery from sitting out the game for nine innings. Fenway Park, built in 1912, has no adequate area for someone to fully prepare himself for pinch running on a cold night. Cool night. Roberts had done the best he could, running in the narrow, short, wet, concrete hallway that leads from the Red Sox dugout to a stairwell that winds to the clubhouse. When Roberts reached first base, he had no intention of stealing second base on the first pitch. On September 17th, he had waited until the third pitch. Rivera made a pickoff throw to first base. Boom, Roberts get back, gets back easily. Then Rivera threw over again, and this time the play was a little closer. So he's just like checking him, you know? And then Rivera threw over for a third time, and this time it was closer still. Something unintended and important had happened with that sequence of three consecutive throws to first base. Roberts was now warm and his legs were loose. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> Rivera had done him a favor. Roberts now was fully immersed. And like the, um, I'm sure his adrenal glands fucking put adrenaline into him. He's like, oh shit. <sighs> yeah. Fucking fight or flight. Um, absolutely. Okay. There was no fourth. Okay. No, 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 no. Rivera had done him a favor. Roberts now was fully immersed in the flow of the game. Boom. He's like, his plan had changed. He made up his mind to steal on the first pitch. Fucking bold, dog. There was no fourth pickoff attempt. Rivera threw home with a pitch to the batter, uh, Miller. Roberts ran. The pitch was a ball. Jorge Posada with a quick release. Loose to strong. Accurate throw to second base. Jeter caught it. Very close to the back. And put a tag on Roberts. But it was too late. Roberts reached the base barely before Jeter applied the tag. The Red Sox had the tying run in scoring position with zero outs. Mueller was a 375 career regular season hitter off Rivera. Damn, what the fuck? How are, how's everyone hitting off Mariano Rivera like this right now? With three hits, including a walk-off homer, July 24th, 2004, and eight at-bats. Damn. I now I, I didn't realize it was de- that these cats were hitting off at Rivera like that. I mean, they did split so many games between each other so i guess it makes some sense miller took the next pitch for a strike evening the count at one and one i gave tito a lot of credit for not bunting epstein said back then mariano really didn't use his sinker away to lefties so if bill miller makes an out it's likely to be a ground ball to the right side that gets him over anyway on the next offering from rivera miller grounded a hard single over the mound over the second base area and into center field. Roberts came bounding home with the tying run. The Red Sox were alive. What were the odds? Through 2004, in his regular season career, Rivera had faced 231 left-handed hitters with a one-run lead in the ninth inning. In only 10 such cases did Rivera blow the lead. 10 such cases, bro. You know what I'm saying? Miller was the only batter responsible for two of those failures, a single on May 28, 2003, and his walk-off home run three months earlier. <laughs> it was all so improbable. There was only a 3.6% chance Rivera would walk the leadoff batter in the ninth with a one-run lead. There was only a 4.3% chance he would lose such a lead while facing a left-handed batter. And yet both of those occurrences, like the two longest shots in a daily double, had come through and paid off for the Red Sox. 
There was still a long way to get there, but was it somehow possible that even the longest of long shots, the 0.85% chance that a pro sports team could come back from being down three games to none was suddenly in play? You start feeling it's possible after the walk, Millar said, but the biggest at bat of the whole thing was by Billy Miller. You hear about the walk, you hear about the stolen base, but who drove him in? Billy Miller got a single to drive in the son of a bitch. Then you hear about Ortiz's walk off on off Orti, Ortiz's 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 walk off off Quantrill and Ortiz's at bat against Louisa. But Billy Miller had the greatest at bat of the postseason. Yeah, because they were down and it was a it was the you know it was the game. The Yankees would still have chances to win the game. <sighs> getting four at bats with the go ahead run because they went to extra innings. Um getting four at bats with the go ahead run and scoring position in the eleventh and twelfth innings. Every one of those at bats ended in failure by Rodriguez, line out, Williams, fly out, Clark, fly out, and Cairo strike out. All outs. <laughs> Gordon pressed into into duty, gave Torrey two shutout innings. Paul Quantrill, the Yankees fifth pitcher, started the twelfth. Ramirez greeted him with a single. Ortiz ended the long night with a walk-off home run. Boom. Boston wins. They're only down 3-1 now. Everything flipped with that game, Millar said. 100%. I said that before the game. The Yankees had not heeded Miller's warning. They had let the idiots win game four. Oh, my God. I'm very uncomfortable at that point, Torrey said. I mean, everybody else feels better than I do. We still have a three games to one lead, but the fact is we had our closer on the mound and we let them breathe. The Yankees were in position to win game 5-2, trailing 2-1 in the sixth against Martinez. Jeter swatted a 3-1 double. Dope. Yet another game-changing play in his long history of clutch postseason moments. But somehow, with multiple chances, the Yankees never scored again over what would be eight more agonizing innings. A series of bad breaks and bad at-bats began that same sixth inning. When the Yankees reloaded the bases... After Jeter's double, with two outs, Hideki Matsui drilled a line drive into right field. Nixon, Trot Nixon, fighting the encroaching twilight, somehow found the ball and caught it for the third out. If that ball isn't ca- caught, it opens up the game, Torrey said. It's over. Of course, when anything happens like that, I think it's a bad sign because you never, ha- you never have enough runs. <sighs> the Yankees looked as if they would add to that 4-2 lead in the eighth inning, too. Cairo led off with a double against reliever Mike Timlin. Torrey ordered Jeter to butt Tim to the third base to give Rodriguez a shot at bringing home a big insurance run. Dog, this is all like, this is, it's perfect. They did so well. I mean, they were 3-1 for a reason, 3-0 for a reason. They were playing great baseball. They had, uh, this, was a, this was in the bag for the Yankees. Torrey ordered Jeter to butt him to third to give Rodriguez a shot at bringing home a big insurance run. Again, the Red Sox had no fear pitching to Rodriguez with a base open, and Timlin rewarded their confidence. Timlin fanned Rodriguez on five pitches. Timlin just blew him away, basically, Torrey said. That, to me, stood out more than anything. It was not being able to get that third run. Alex Rodriguez was not a fucking RBI. I mean, he was a big, like, during the regular season and shit, you know, but I don't know, whatever. Sheffield walked after Rodriguez's whiff. Then Matsui lined out again, this time to left field, to end the threat. Caught, done. Still, the Yankees had a two-run lead with six outs to go. This sounds familiar. To end the series. What were the odds they could blow that? Among the 766 postseason... So many stats, you know, to just not make me even more pissed off. Among the 766 postseason games in best of seven series to that point, road teams with a two-run lead with six outs to go were 67-10. and 10 representing an 87% success rate. The Yankees still held a firm grip on the series. The game was in the hands of Gordon, who had pitched to one batter in the seventh, getting a double play. Gordon had been excitable all series, so unable to calm his anxieties that he had been throwing up in the Yankees' bullpen before coming into the game. Flash always got very excited in the bullpen, said Borzello, the bullpen catcher. There was nothing different about that game uh, versus any other. Flash is high-strung and cares a lot. I don't think it's fear. I think it's more just the anxiety of not being out there yet. This moment is coming, and he knows it's there, and he gets anxious. I think he just reacts to that. I don't think he's scared. He's not afraid of anything, and he wants the ball, and he wants to win. People want to paint that as he was scared. I don't see that at all. 
him throwing up before coming into the game reminds me of when I opened up for Bone Thugs at Harmony um, at the old Bricks, rest in peace. And I went on stage, DJ uh, Electronic Battleship. He goes, uh, I just goes by Battleship now, I believe. But uh, we, I went on there to hype the crowd up, and it was super sick. It was dope. It was packed ass house. Bone Thugs and Harmony was there for their East Eternal 1999 tour. They were like, it was like one of the last times that they had done it all together. Anyway, so I go out there hyping everyone up. As soon as I get on the stage, dog, my um, stomach was. Uh, it was it was fucking wild. Like I I felt like I was gonna fucking throw up on stage, for real. Like I was like yo yo every with every yo I was like I, something's coming out and this whole front section is gonna get like everything I've ate that day and whatever I drank that day too. Anyway, so I bring everyone I bring my uh, crew on the stage and I run off. I had to run off. I run off. There's thank God there was a, a garbage can just right off stage. I run off, go down the stairs, boom, and fucking puked like i've never i've puked i've i've puked but that was like i was like it was fucking everywhere dog and went back up on stage and finished it out but i was so anxious like i can relate to that but i had never done that since but i was so anxious the crowd was so wild that i for real puked on stage or not on stage but like right off of it anyway gordon coughed up more than his lunch (laughs) oh you funny fuckers all right uh his second pitch of the eighth inning was hammered by ortiz for a home run Ugh. now it was four to three gordon then managed to get two swinging strikes on millar dope but then threw four consecutive balls to put the tying run on first base with no outs to complete the symmetry of another key walk by millar roberts replaced him as a pinch runner gordon fell behind trot nixon three and one and then nixon slashed a single up the middle roberts scooted to third base Gordon had faced three batters in the eighth inning with a two-run lead and retired none of them, going home run, walk, single. Torrey brought in Rivera in what would technically be recorded as a blown save, but Rivera did well to get out of the jam. Dope, first and third, no outs. With only one run, scoring a sacrifice fly by Veritek. It's It's a blown save, but it certainly wasn't his fault, Torrey said. Tom Gordon, for whatever reason, was a mess out there. The Yankees would never lead again in the series. They, did, uh, they didn't nearly win it in the ninth when Clark smashed a two-out hit into the right field corner that appeared was, uh, would score Ruben Sierra from first base, but the ball hopped into the stands for a grand rule double, and Sierra was ordered stopped at third base. Whence he stayed when Cairo lofted a foul pop-up for the third out. It was another bad sign for the Yankees. The Cape West wasting chances in extra innings, too, in the 11th inning with a runner at second base. Jeter lined out and Rodriguez flied out in the 13th. They're just playing in the 13th. Sierra struck out with runners at second and third. The longer the game went on, the tighter the Yankees looked In extra innings. They went two for 18 against four Boston relievers while striking out in half of those at bats in the 14th inning. Torrey had Loiza, his seventh pitcher on the mound, for his third inning of work. Loiza walked Damon, Johnny Damon, with one out. He walked Ramirez with two outs. Then on the 10th pitch of the at-bat and the 471st pitch of that game, which came five hours and 49 minutes after the first one. That's fucking terrible. Ortiz smacked a base hit up the middle to send Damon home with the winning run. The Yankees were stunned. They led the series three games. Um, yeah, they led the series three games. Uh, wait, I lost my because I was looking at something else. They led the series three games to two, but to everyone involved now, it felt as if they were chasing Boston. They had played two games at Fenway that lasted a total of 10 hours and 51 minutes, two games in which they held leads in the eighth and ninth inning. That statistically gave them win probabilities of 87.5 and 87%, and somehow they had managed to lose both of them. It was draining, Tori said. The Yankees were going home uh, to Yankee Stadium for game six, okay? And their mission had changed, become psychologically more heavy and complicated. They were no longer trying to win the series. They were trying not to blow it. (laughs) The Yankees had John Lieber to face Kurt Schilling in game six. Unbeknownst to the Yankees, Schilling had undergone an unprecedented medical procedure to keep the torn tendon sheathed in his ankle from flapping open. That sounds fucking awful, by the way. From flapping open, dog? What the fuck are you talking about? A temporary suturing of the sheath that had been tried as an experiment on a cadaver. Uh, what? <laughs> a, te- a, a, sh- a 
an experiment on a cadaver. You know what? This is what we uh, just tried this on a uh, dead person. Um, Going to be temporary, but you can go out there and pitch. I mean, it's not a lot of. Um, I mean, like, if there is a lot of exertion. I was going to just like check. Uh, downplay pitching but there's a lot of fucking downward moving and all that shit all right anyway <sighs> um a temporary suturing of the sheet that had been tried as an experiment on a cadaver no one was sure if the suturing would hold up and this is the this is the uh one out excuse me this is the uh bloody sock game indeed even as shilling started to warm in the bullpen blood started oozing from the area of the incision and through his white sanitary sock there was some speculation that the Yankees would test Schilling's mobility early in the game by bunting on him, but Torrey, unaware of the true extent of the injury, spoke to his team before the game about taking the same approach they always did against Schilling. I basically said, I don't believe this whole injury aspect of it, Torrey said. You go out there and play your game. We had pretty good success against, success against him, so I didn't want to do anything different. Let's make him make the adjustment. We just had to go play the game. And I just try to add perspective that we're home and that we have a 3-2 lead, but it's very difficult when you lose a couple of games. You sort of lose your footing. No pun intended. The Red Sox, meanwhile, only grew bolder and looser with each win. Millar decided before the game that the team would not take batting practice on the field before game six. It was raining, Millar said. It was like 47 degrees. They always play Yankeeography in New York on the video board. As a vid visiting player, you see that they get music to hit to, and when we come up, we get Yogi Bear and Mickey Mantle all the time. Molhar walked into the office of Francona. We're not hitting on the field today, Skip, Molhar said. We're not falling for the Yankeeography crap. Francona barely looked up from his desk. Whatever you guys want, the manager replied. The idiots were running the asylum. As Millar walked out of the office, something caught his eye. A big bottle of Jack Daniels, he said. Millar got an idea. The Red Sox would all drink a pregame toast for good luck. Okay? Get a little loose. He started pouring shots for guys into paper cups, which you know were not like single shots. He'd fucking, you know, some heavy pour. Um, two days earlier, the Red Sox were stuck at the bottom of a dark well from which no baseball team ever had recovered. Trailing a best of seven series, three games to none, and now here they were in Yankee Stadium, essentially flipping the finger at Yankee history as presented in Yankeeography, um, has your uh, Yankeeography, and lifting paper cup shots of whiskey to toast themselves and their audacity. It was more of a joke, more just messing around. Millar said, "It's not like we got drunk. That's what I got heat for. People thinking we got hammered. We did a toast. The next thing you know, we won." Shilling on one good ankle and one gruesome one was spectacular this game was the very reason why epstein had recruited him recruited him over thanksgiving dinner Schilling fired seven strong innings in which he allowed only one run and that was a home run by bernie williams in his last inning and permitted just four hits and no walks the yankees never did bunt on the man with the bloody sock boston won four two scoring all of its runs in the fourth inning three of them on a two strike two out opposite field home run by mark bellhorn against john lieber Sometimes all you need, dog, just a little bit of fucking luck in one inning. We had a little role reversal with Boston, Giambi said. Jason Giambi. Until they got Schilling to go with Pedro, we could beat them. Then once they had that extra guy, that's what turned the table for them. That's where they turned the tide on us. The series was tied. 3-3. The Yankees had the look of one of those cadavers that made possible the procedure on Schilling's ankle. Love the reading in the, or the writing. Torrey had a huge problem as soon as Game 6 ended. He still did not know who was going to pitch for the Yankees in Game 7. The Yankees' lack of reliable starting pitching had come to a head. Over the previous winter, the Angels had signed Bartolo Colon. The Astros had signed Pettit. The Red Sox had stolen Schilling out from under the Yankees. And the Yankees had lost Clemens, Pettit, and Wells and replaced them with Brown, Vasquez, and Lieber. Hernandez and Loiza. Musina and Lieber were not available because they had pitched games five and game six. Torrey had no good options. Hernandez wasn't an option at all. El Duque had told Sotomayor he was not available on two days of rest after throwing 95 pitches in game four. Lowe, his Derek Lowe, his opposing starter who threw 88 pitches in the same game, was Boston's pick to start game seven. Okay. Loiza wasn't an option either. He had only one day of rest after throwing 59 pitches out of the bullpen in game five. Vasquez had three days of rest after throwing 96 pitches in less than five innings. 
in his shaky relief outing in game three. Torrey could not trust him. Of course not. The Yankees thought Vasquez, who turned 28 that summer, would be exactly the kind of young gun their staff needed. He took the part for half of the season, going 10-5 and five with a 3.56 ERA and earning Torrey's selection for the All-Star game. Dope. But mysteriously, with no apparent injury, Vasquez became completely unreliable. <laughs> but mysteriously, with no apparent injury, he probably just, I don't know. Never mind. I'm not even going to go on that. He went 4-5 and five with a 6.92 ERA in the second half of the season. The biggest shock for me was Vasquez, Torrey said. He pitches opening day. I picked him for the All-Star game. And it was ridiculous where he went after that. He was a huge pitcher for us because all of a sudden we were getting younger. I remember Cash said to me, I can get Randy Johnson from Arizona, but they want Vasquez. I said, I wouldn't make that deal. That's what I thought of him early on. Later on, after the season, you can go ahead and give him up. (laughs) Damn, they could have got Randy Johnson from Arizona earlier than expected. I didn't know that. Okay. But whatever, as he mentioned, you know, he was on a fucking tear. So Vasquez really wasn't an option to inspire any confidence. That left Kevin Brown, the 39-year-old pitcher with the bad back, the carrier, bad karma, uh, and the guy who looked hurt and ineffective in game three and only his fourth game since breaking his left hand in the childish fit of rage. Were the re- Yankees really going to trust Game 7 to Brown? Not even Torrey was sure of that. The Yankees were never sure of his brittle physical condition. As soon as Game 6 ended, Torrey went looking for Brown in the clubhouse. He found him in the players' lounge off the main clubhouse. Brown was sitting at a table just past the bar area with his back to the door of the clubhouse. Torrey sat down in a chair across from him, across from him with his back to the wall. Sotomayor pulled up a chair, too. Other players were milling about. That looked like a, a like that scene was painted picture or picture perfect for me. Just like sitting there, just like with a drink, just like sadly, like a sad sap, drinking it too, just like and sipping it like that. <laughs> I was just trying to make a decision. Tori said, "We're trying, we're trying to keep from choking to death at that point." Because Lieber pitched pretty well, but he gave up the 3 1 homer to Bellhorn, and that was the difference in the game. Everybody was as tight as a drum, which was understandable because we had lost three games in a row. Duh. Torrey looked Brown, Kevin Brown, in the eye and said, You tell me. You tell me. Can you pitch tomorrow? I don't need a hero. I need somebody who can do the job. Just looking at him, you tell me. I don't fucking need a hero. Just need someone who can fucking pitch. Can you do that? Kevin Brown looked back at him and was like, Yeah, I think so. It was in virtually the same speech Torrey gave to a worn down Clemens in the training room before game five of the 2001 division series. Clemens assured Torrey he could do it that night. And gave him five good innings. I trust Roger Clemens over Kevin Brown. That's basically what I was hoping for from Brown. Something to sort of settle the game, Torrey said. But he was so unlike anything I thought he was supposed to be. I watched him pitch in Texas, and his shit was so good. But he was never satisfied with his stuff. He had issues. It was sad. Torrey continued with Brown. I need a pitcher tomorrow, he said. You're one of my choices. I'm not going to give you the ball unless you understand what we need to do here. You need to look at me and tell me. I'll take the ball, Brown said. Said Tori. He gave me a positive response. I would have given it to Vasquez if I sensed it was something like, well, if you want me to, I didn't get it. If you want me to, to me, he was willing to take on the responsibility. The Yankees' season and the possibility of warding off the greatest collapse of all time had come down to this. They were giving the ball to Kevin Brown, a guy with a bad back, and a guy his teammates did not particularly trust, understand, or like. I thought, it's over, Brazello said. It's over because Kevin Brown had no chance at all, and neither does Javier Vasquez or anybody else. It's over. I remember standing in the outfield with Musina and a couple of other guys during batting practice, and we were just talking about it. We have no chance. There's just no chance of winning this game. We lost the series. 
I remember that. I remember just standing in the outfield in game seven like we had already lost. People didn't trust Brown. He was never part of the team, and now our hopes were on him. We let it go to that. We let it go to get to that point, and there's no way we're going to be able to survive. We had our shots. We had three games to do it, and now it's come to this. We deserve to lose. I mean, all the people, Kevin Brown, some guys hated him. Guys just didn't understand him. He always had something wrong. His back, this or that. Said Musina, we're calling the team's feelings before game seven. Mike Musina. We're finished. That was a feeling after game six. As soon as game six ended, they're going into the game just like they're not even going to fucking finish it out. Ugh. Oh, that's so fucking terrible to know now. Because when, I mean, you know, you're watching the game and you think that there might be a chance or some shit. Even with Kevin Brown going to the fucking mound, you know, that there's some inkling of effort that's going to be coming from guys. But it's hard to, it's hard to like... Because they're uh, because how the media paints an, uh, excuse me um, professional athletes like to think that they have emotions or like to think of them as regular people like us but like everyone's people are people man and they they're fucking everything was crushed after game six so yeah I get it there were no more Andy Pettits or David Wells's or David Cones to turn up to turn to at a time like this. The 2004 Yankees had an entirely different DNA from the championship Yankee teams. Starting with the trade for A-Rod and his need to be needed, continuing with Kenny Lofton in spring trading, fretting over the all-star ballot, Contreras and Vasquez being unable to pitch in New York, Sheffield moping for two months because he wasn't sure his manager wanted him, Giambi becoming a non-factor because of his tumor and Balco connection, Balco, fucking steroids, and Brown, the broken down lone wolf on whose cranky back rested all the Yankees hopes. The core of trust that had served the Yankees so well was now diminished by an influx of outside stars who brought their individual needs and anxieties into the equation. It goes back to David Cohn. Borzello said David Cohn never ever would tell you anything was wrong with him. I remember charting a game and the first three pitches of the game were 78 miles an hour. I thought they were splitters. And after the game, he went five innings and he won the game. I walked over to him. I said, Coney, you were throwing 78 to 82 tops with your fastball. Do you want me to hand this chart in? Now, this was before they started putting up velocities on the stadium scoreboard. So I'm the only one who knew how hard he was throwing. It wasn't on TV. It wasn't in the stadium. And he goes, really? Yeah, I really didn't give. Uh, I really didn't have much, did I? Oh, no. He said, really? Yeah, I really didn't have much, did I? I go, you didn't have much. He goes, you might want to bump it up so you don't scare anybody. <laughs> He never thought he could win the game. And Kevin Brown was not like that. It was, if I wasn't throwing 98, I can't win. And guys didn't like that. It's a lack of competitiveness. Torrey knew his team was tight before game seven, so he called a quick meeting in the clubhouse. Okay, let's get this fucking crack in. Here we go. He tried to relax his pair by staying upbeat and asking other people to speak. Cool. Including Yogi Berra and Hideki Matsui. It was always good for a laugh when he would end up end meetings with in his thick Japanese accent. I'm going to do a Japanese accent. Get ready for that. Um, in his thick Japanese accent with one of the few English phrases he had mastered. Let's, oh, ooh. you ready? Let's kick the fucking ass. No, oh, that didn't. Oh, well, said Tori, there's a little uneasiness at that point. That's funny, though. They were all laughing at that shit. Um, said Tori, there's, there's a little uneasiness at that point, and you'd like to bring a little levity into it. I was just trying to lighten the mood at that point. I just had a sense that Kevin Brown really wasn't a good sale in the clubhouse. Yeah, don't let him talk. Naturally, the idiots on the other side of the field were, if possible, even looser than the game before. Lowe, Derek Lowe, the starting pitcher, was so loose that only then did he realize he had left his spikes back in Boston. Fuck! Lou Kakuza, the... Visiting clubhouse manager at Yankee Stadium had to call a local sporting goods store to find spikes for Boston's Game 7 p starting pitcher. Story time. When I was in high school, um, I played uh, like played football and shit. Um, <laughs> I probably should have thought about this before I said story time because I, I, I don't know if I should admit this. Whatever. Here it goes. Uh, we were playing Juan Diego. I, uh, well, a rival. And, um, I might have had, I might have had a drink or two, uh, like a beer or two, uh, before the game. And I forgot my cleats and I was starting and everything. 
So anyway, that's the end of that story time. And no more was ever said after that about high school drinking. Uh, we left our hotel rooms, and all I said before we left was, today we have a chance to shock the world, Millar said. It's never been done. We're, we were down through 3 We were down in game four. We were down in game five. Today we have a chance to shock the world. When we left our hotel rooms and checked out, we knew we were going back to Boston that night after a chance to shock the world, and that was the truth. How many times can you say that in your lifetime? The world is watching this game. The world knows the ramifications. That group, that team, changed the Red Sox franchise. Teams win championships, not players. Our team was just too tight, sticking together, grinding things out, and that's what I try to stress to this day. Teams win championships, not salaries, not looks, not players, teams. The Red Sox have become more like the championship Yankees than the Yankees, except, of course, for the long hair, beards, irreverence, and shots of whiskey. For Game 7, they stuck to Millar's Game 6 pregame preparation, no branding practice on the field, no Yankeeography, but shots of Jack Daniels all around. Game 7 was a blowout. Boom. It was over by the second inning. Brown was as bad as the Yankees feared. He faced nine batters and retired only three of them. Ortiz hit a two-run home run in the first inning. The Red Sox loaded the bases in the second inning with a single and two walks, prompting Torrey to replace Brown with Vasquez. Damon slammed Vasquez's first pitch for a grand slam. Damn, it was 6-0 to zero before the Yankees even had a base runner or a chance to get their fourth batter to the plate. Looking back, he wasn't very good, Torrey said to Brown who had a 21.60 ERA in the ALCS. A 21.60 ERA, dog. 21.6 earned run average. It's the old thing about pitching hurt or pitching stupid. Pitching hurt or playing hurt is when you can go out there and still get the job done. Playing stupid is when you can't get the job done. Now you're letting everyone down. The final score was 10-3. to The rise of the Red, Co Red Sox was complete. They had wiped out all the ground from the Yankees, established over Boston as the superior team from 1996 through 2003. The Red Sox, better than any other franchise, had exploited the explosion of information and revenues that had changed the baseball's landscape since the Yankees were winning titles. Most of the key players in the key moments of the 2004 ALCS were obtained as the Red Sox rode the cutting edge of player evaluation. David Ortiz, Kevin Millar, Bill Miller, Dave Roberts, all of them were obtained cheaply and without much competition because Boston understood the importance of measuring a player by his ability to get on base rather than the traditional but flawed yardstick of batting average. Um, I just watched Moneyball uh, with Brad Pitt in it, which um, goes over the story of uh, Billy. Um, come on, what the fuck is his name? Um, Billy. Uh, the fucking Oakland A's manager. This is going to fucking bug me. But as I'm explaining this, um, Billy Bean. Uh, Billy Bean, after 2001 or 2002, was offered the job to become the Yankees at general, or excuse me, to become the um, Red Sox general manager before this 2004 ALCS in which they won the World Series. But what they, what they just described right there as far as like getting players that were underpaid, um, well, that they could get for better prices just because they can get on base and shit like that. That's that money ball theory that uh, Billy Bean had instituted in Oakland, which made him like a genius or whatever. Even still, the athletics still haven't fucking won a, a World Series. But many teams have adopted that philosophy of the money ball. So that's exactly what fucking happened. So they were just – they did a fantastic job. All of them were obtained cheaply and without much competition because Boston understood the importance of uh, measuring a player by his ability to get on base. Yep, rather than the traditional but flawed yardstick of batting average. That advantage would go away as statistical, analytical methods became mainstream, a factor in helping to usher in a parity in the industry that also conspired against the Yankees. That's what I'm talking about. The last bit of ground Boston conquered to gain control of baseball's uh, Peloponnesian War of was represented by Schilling. The ace they squired out from under the Yankees while the turkey and stuffing were cooking. Torrey always maintained that the foundation um, to the Yankees' championship years was pitching, particularly starting pitching. Um, while the Yankees lost their way on making evaluations and acquisitions on starting pitchers, the Red Sox knew Schilling was the last piece of the kind of championship rotation that the Yankees once flaunted. In past seasons, the Red Sox always started out really well, Torrey said. 
because they had guys who, whether it was a retread or whatever it was, would pitch real well early. And then eventually the cream rises to the top and the guys who aren't as good would be exposed. And it really wasn't until they addressed their pitching that they became this force. They always had Pedro, but there was always a way we could get around Pedro. We could just hold them at bay until we could run his pitch count to get him out of the game. Then we'd win. The Yankees' superiority stopped dead cold in that 2004 LCS. The Yankees were saddled not only with the worst collapse in baseball history, but also the insult of having the hate, uh, hated Red Sox spill champagne in their stadium. Super dope. Uh, Torrey brought his team together for a brief meeting after the game. He thanked his players for their effort, and when he looked around the room, he realized that the Yankees, who once came to know the World Series as an expected extension of their season, were full players who had never been there before. The sad part about this for me, Torrey told them, is the guys in this room that have never been in the World Series, guys like Tony Clark, one of the classiest guys I've ever been around, said Torrey. Of course, the guy I didn't mention who was in the back of my mind was Don Mattingly. All those years with the Yankees, they had never been to the World Series. Torrey picked up the telephone in his office and called over to the visiting clubhouse. He, congratulate, he congratulated his friend, Francona. He asked to speak to Tim Wakefield, the pitcher who one year earlier was near tears in that same clubhouse after giving up the home run to Aaron Boone. Now Wakefield was going to the World Series. After he hung up the phone, Tim Wakefield said out loud to no one in particular, I'll never forget that phone call that shows so much class. So it was done. The 2004 Yankees were history. They would be remembered for all the wrong reasons. How did it go so wrong? What would most uh, what would most stick with the players about the failure to close out the Red Sox? Musina thinks about those questions, and he thinks about the same team who closed out all those championships before Musina joined the Yankees in 2001. We were up 3-0, and Mo came in again with the lead and lost it, Musina said. He lost it again. As great as he is, and it's amazing what he does, if you start the evaluation again since I got here, he has accomplished nothing in comparison to what he accomplished the four years before. Shots fired right there, dog. He just shot. I need to get a fucking a, a gunshot sound, yo. Oh, he lost it again. As great as he is, it's amazing what he does. If you start the evalu evaluation again since I got here, he has accomplished nothing in comparison to what he accomplished the four years before. He blew the World Series in 2001. He lost the Boston Series. He didn't lose it himself, but we had a chance to win in the ninth and sweep them, and he doesn't do it there. I know you look at everything he's done, and it's been awesome. I'll admit that, but it, has, it sounds so fucking bitter, as he should be a little bit, but like, fucking to mariano rivera but it hadn't been the same in those couple of years that's what i remember about the old four series <laughs> oh, shit. oh man it wasn't long after game seven that tory received a call from george steinbrenner boss i feel bad tory told him i'm sorry it happened but you can't lose any sleep over this i wish i could sit here and tell you i wish i had done something different I mean, game seven, we didn't have any options. And I mean, game four, you put Mariano Rivera on the mound with a lead in the ninth inning. You lose the game. Excuse me, game five, you have a two-run lead with Gordon on the mound and you lose the game. What do you change? You don't change anything. But deep down, Torrey knew Steinbrenner wasn't going to let go so easily of such a painful defeat. Torrey's Teflon status as Yankees manager was gone. The lion tamer, who somehow could always stick his head into his mouth with a big cat named Steinbrenner and emerge unscathed, no longer had that same magic touch. He was on dangerous ground now. From this moment on, each year for him would become more difficult than the last. Obviously, the embarrassment got to him, Tori said. There was more after that with him. That's when this whole underground campaign started with me. Woo! That was fucking quite the story there um chapter 10 of the yankee years joe torrey and tom verducci uh how the yankees uh blew that lead in the 2004 alcs not much more to be said uh beyond what i said during it um super dope man i certainly appreciate all of uh you know all the support and everything I'm, I'm a little fucking fluster right now i gotta try to fucking catch my bearings about this um okay hold on okay here we go Big shout out to uh, our partner, Extra T Media. 
Please go to extrateamedia.com. Follow on uh, Twitter as well, at Extra T Media and at George Life. Um, is it G Life? George Life. George Life, at George Life. Okay, well, I mean, the, there'll be the uh, links here anyway, but um make yeah honestly uh it's been it's gonna continue to progress i mean we're three videos in and um i'm very excited about what uh, the future is going to hold for it but yeah short story being uh, episode 53 uh the yankee years and uh yeah that's it man we're out spare fingers yes